Getting ready now for my capstone project, and uh, this is the day for my teaching demonstration. I'm now in uh, PCIT, and this is the Innovation Studio, which is one of the uh, modern smart rooms of PCIT. Anytime. I'm actually uh, with my daughter who's doing the video documentation over there, so if you want to be on TV, I'm uh, just kidding. Um, or, all right, uh, I hope that you have signed, uh, Phil, you know, signed and uh, written your email addresses just in case you want a copy of the video or a copy of the presentation or a copy of uh, the form itself. I can uh, pass this around if you wish. Uh, because I think some were not able to sign up uh, yesterday, okay? All right, um, I mentioned yesterday that this is for my capstone teaching demonstration for the Provincial Instructor Diploma Program. And I'm very grateful once again to Chris for allowing me this teaching opportunity and for this uh, privilege of meeting you and doing it here in your smart room, the Innovation Studio. Okay. Now, my topic for today is engaging memo writing with mind mapping and problem solving as tools. And it's going to be a lecture workshop because we would like to engage you in some activities later on. Let me start with the learning outcome. The learning outcome is for you to be able to draft a mind map of a topic for a memo writing exercise and also to appreciate problem solving as a creative part of learning. Now, generally speaking, when you talk of learning outcomes, they don't usually uh, emerge immediately after an activity, especially a 45 minute or an hour activity. So we're more focused on the objectives for the day. The first objective is to identify the purposes, the general parts, and format of a business memo, which I hope you have read, because this material was given to me by Chris yesterday. We will showcase mind mapping as a creative tool for preparing a memo, and we facilitate accomplishment of the assignment by providing you with guide steps for mind mapping and strategies for problem solving. Uh, do you want to start with a fun activity? Because I prepared a fun activity at the start, which I hope you will be able to relate later on with what you wanted to come up with at the end of this lecture workshop. Have you ever tried eating a, a boiled egg in a minute? <coughs> Anyone? <coughs> Have you ever timed yourself when you filled a boiled egg? No? Because it doesn't really matter so much for as long as you open it and you eat it up and that's it. Right? Okay, I'd like to try this activity and I need three volunteers. You think I can get a volunteer here? Any volunteer? Thank you. Okay, we have one, two more. Maybe a gentleman can volunteer. Okay, one lady, one brave lady. Don't we have gentlemen volunteering for this activity? Hmm? Maybe just one volunteer. The gentleman at the back. Okay, thank you. Now we will request the three of you please come up here and we'll give you the instruction on how you can peel a boiled egg. Okay, and let's see if you can do this in a minute. Okay, up one. Okay. Alright, I prepared water for you just in case you would like to eat your egg and you know, you might choke when you eat your egg. Alright, let's start. Open your, uh, take out the egg from the plastic. Now, oops, wait, wait, wait. Wait for the instruction. You're supposed to bring each side of the egg. So one side and the other side. Okay. Okay, just one side and the other side. Nothing in between. Okay. <laughs> okay, is it soft? Oh dear. Okay, put it back in the plastic. Okay. 
Oh, sorry for that. Now I have. Uh, oh, no. I kind of didn't like that. No problem. <laughs> here, here. You're saying. Hand sanitizer? Okay. Here. My question is Did you expect that to happen? Did any one of you expect that to happen? That it will be um, soft boil? If it's soft, never mind. You don't have to open it. Because my question here is related to the sensitivity. Just put it back in the plastic uh, bag. And we'll ask you why we did that activity. Okay? Can we can we give a big hand to the three brave souls? Thank you. What's your name? Omar. Omar. Thank you, Omar and yeah. Jan yeah. and Yang Yang. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. The question is, what seems to be the situation that you saw? Do you think there was a, a problem? Was there a problem? Definitely there was a problem, right? Yeah. What was the problem? The eggs were not hard boiled, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And therefore it did not really work. Now why are we talking about this? Because in BCIT, and this is what I learned from friends and colleagues, BCIT has an expertise in problem solving. And even when you do your memo writing, you're actually engaged in solving problems. For that activity, the students were supposed to see, you know, the volunteers were supposed to see and know how looking at two sides of a problematic situation or issue fast tracks problem resolution. But we learned that there was an initial problem of the egg not being hard boiled. Okay? So let's look at problem solving. Because today we wanted to use problem solving and mind mapping as tools for preparing to write a business memo. And you have a problem. You have Chris saying, I need you to write a memo. And how many of you read the material that was given to you yesterday? How many? Honestly, did you read the material? No? You never had a chance? Okay, it's not a problem. We'll go through it anyway because I'm going to make a quick uh, review of that material. Okay, so that is a problem because you have not read it and you don't really know how to write a memo. Let's start with the purpose of a business memo. There, are, there is a two-fold purpose for a business memo. The first one is it brings attention to problems. And secondly, it solves problems. So when you prepare a memorandum, a business memo, it's usually focused on a problem. You want to bring attention to it, and you want to solve that problem. A memo also informs the reader about new information like policy changes, price increases, etc or it persuades the reader to take an action, like attending a meeting, changing a current production procedure, etc. But regardless of the specific goal, memos are most effective when they connect to the purpose of the writer and the interests and the needs of the reader. How many of you remember the principle that was also mentioned yesterday by Chris? Purpose, audience, and Topic. 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 The path principle. Okay, we start off with a purpose. Second, we talk about the audience. When you issue or when you draft and issue a memorandum, you ensure that all the people that the memo is addressed to need to read the memo. Because if you just want to communicate to one person, you don't have to issue a memo. Right? Sometimes it's even more important to speak with a person face to face. Make sure that when you draft a topic or a content for your memo, the material is not very sensitive. Okay? And memos are most effectively used when sent 
to a small to moderate amount of people to communicate your objectives. By the way, if I talk too fast, just tell me, okay? I have a tendency to talk very fast. All right? So if you have a question, you don't, uh, don't, uh, I don't mind if you interrupt. Okay. Now what are the different parts, the general parts of a memo? And this information is drawn from the material that was given to you by Chris yesterday. You have the heading, which usually occupies one eighth of the memo. And usually a memo is just a page or two. And you have the opening and the context and the task, which occupy one fourth of that memorandum. You have the summary and the discussion, which is the longest part and that occupies a half of your memo. And you have the closing and if needed, your attachments. Okay? So these are the general parts. So when you start drafting your memo, consider all these parts. Let's look at the first part, the heading segment. What seems to be the problem in this memo? Look at the addressee for that memo, to John Doe. Your material will tell you it's not enough to just put the name. You need to be Specific, write the correct name of the person, okay, and put the job title. And when you look at the subject, right there at the bottom, from to to Ray, my memo to all, you need to be more specific. You need to be more concise, not just a general subject matter, okay? That's for the heading. The opening segment always sets the purpose of the memo. And it includes, it includes the following. In the opening segment, you put there the purpose. What is the context and the problem? What do you mean by context? The context refers to the situation that you are confronted with. What is the context and what is the problem? And you need to put there what is your specific assignment or task. You find all these three elements in the opening segment. Then you look at the context. The context, as I was saying earlier, refers to the event or the circumstance or the background of the problem you're solving. And generally, it starts with the, with the phrase, through market research and analysis. That's just one example, okay? But remember, the importance of the context is for the reader to know what is the premise of your, of the request, of the task that you're asking the person to do? Am I clear so far? No, not clear? You want me to repeat uh, context? No? Not clear from the very start? Honestly, you have to tell me so I can slow down. Are you sure? Yeah. You know, if you have a question later, you can ask me, all right? Okay. Let me move on. The task segment. The task segment asks you, you, the writer of that memo, to describe what you are doing to help solve the problem. So if an action is requested, something is being asked of you, how would you state the task segment in a memo? You can start off with, you ask that I look at this problem. Okay? Or, if you want to explain intentions because you're the one issuing a task to someone through a memo, you say, to determine the best method of promoting the new fall line, I will, and you continue. These are just examples. And of course, there are many ways to write the task segment. You also have the summary segment. Now, usually, because the memo is not longer than a page, if it is longer than a page, you might need a summary segment. And it's usually a brief statement of key recommendations that are reached. And they may include references to methods and sources used in your research. What about the discussion segments? This, the discussion segments are the longest portions 
of the memo. And this include details that support your ideas. And it usually begins with, or it always begins with, the most important information. And you start from the general to the specific or supporting facts. Okay? The closing segment. Close with courteous ending that states what action you want the reader to take. For instance, this is an example. I will be glad to discuss this recommendation with you during our Tuesday trip to the spa and follow through on any decisions you make. This is a very good example of a closing segment in a memo. And you have the necessary attachments, which may be a list, or this, these may be graphs or tables. And make sure that if you have an attachment to a memo, you need to refer that in a memo. You need to mention in the memo that you are attaching these documents. For example, attach focus groups, results, contributors, and you have the names of Bruce, Jamie, and Juan, for instance. Okay? What about the format? The format follows general guidelines of business writing, and as I said earlier, usually just one page or two pages. It is single space. It's always left justified. And when you show new paragraphs, you skip a line between sentences and always use headings. Okay? All right. Maybe later, when we do the workshop, and you see the sample work, sample memorandum, you would know what these parts are, okay? So my question is, did anyone attempt to email a draft memo to Chris? Probably not. Okay, too soon to ask, right? Okay, so what? Chris, you got no memo, right? So let's start with the assignment. Okay, this is the workshop uh, portion now. Uh, I only have 45 minutes. I hope we can do this within the time frame. Okay, if you read the material that was given to you, you have there in your assignment that you are asked to think of an organization or an institution and a change that it might be considering. Okay, I suggest that you think of a, or an organization that you might be interested to be part of, or if you are a member of any organization right now, you may want to consider working on that, okay? And you need to identify a topic and arrange a relevant survey of a small group of consumers. And you're supposed to write a memo describing your findings, and you should be ready to display your report in class, maybe next meeting. That's your assignment, that's what it says here. Okay, let me help you with working on the assignment through a technique which we call mind mapping. And I'm sure that Chris mentioned this to you. I would like to share with you an assignment that I made for my uh, PIDP course. I took up a course called Evaluation of Learning. And uh, we were tasked to come up with a video, and I chose to work on mind mapping. So I'm going to show you a seven to eight minute video on mind mapping, and I hope that you would listen carefully, watch the video, so that we can prepare ourselves for the workshop right after. Okay? This is Beth Soriano presenting to you Mind Mapping, a course requirement for BIDP 3230 Evaluation of Learning under DOG Major. Let me present to you the outline of this presentation. I'm going to describe to you and give the purpose of Mind Mapping, when Mind Mapping is useful, how to analyze, what are the pros and cons, and how to do concept or Mind Mapping. Let me begin with a description. 
Concept maps are drawings or diagrams showing mental connections. The technique is one of the simplest yet most powerful tools of engagement which a teacher should keep in her creativity toolbox. It is a nonlinear way of organizing information and a technique that allows one to capture the natural flow of ideas. Why would teachers choose to do mind maps? Mind maps would engage students' interests in identifying patterns of association made in relation to a given focal concept. Mind maps help develop the following abilities in students. To think for oneself and be open to new ideas. To draw inferences from observations. Synthesize and integrate. Or to see the forest as well as the trees. And to understand perspectives and values. When are mind maps useful? They're useful to discover preconcepts and prior knowledge structures. They assess connections between theories and concepts and information. They determine ability of students in organizing details into correct and memorable conceptual networks and assess changes in students' conceptual representations. It's also a good tool for note-taking and brainstorming how do you analyze mind maps? Well, teachers' maps can serve as the master copies for comparison, but expect creative responses from students. One must consider both the content and the types of relations. You can code data in a matrix that juxtaposes degree of relationship from primary, secondary, tertiary, and type of relationship like set, subset, part, whole, cause and effect, etc. And then you count the number of responses in each cell and the balance among cells which are analyzed. Let's talk about the pros of mind mapping. Mind mapping would be a low-tech way to get graphic view of students' conceptual associations. And therefore, it favors students with strong visual learning skills. It prompts students to consider how ideas are related and to realize that those associations are changeable. They serve as pre-writing and note-taking devices. A mind map is a very powerful self-assessment technique. What are the cons for mind maps? Comparison among student responses can be difficult unless responses are restricted to choices from a close list of terms. However, it will diminish student creativity and variability of responses. Students with verbal skills but low graphic skills will find the activity frustrating and even question its value. Let's talk about mind mapping in eight easy steps. Step number one, center first. Our linear left brain education system has taught us to start in the upper left hand corner of a page. However, our mind focuses on the center. So mind mapping begins with a word or an image that symbolizes what you want to think about placed in the middle of the page. Let's move to step two. Lighten up. Let go of the idea of finding a cure for cancer or ending hunger, solving the problem, or writing a report that your teacher will love. My mapping is simply a brain dumping process that helps stimulate new ideas and connections. Start with an open, playful attitude. You can always get serious later. Step three, free associate. As ideas emerge, print one or two word descriptions of the ideas on lines branching from the central focus. Allow the ideas to expand outward into branches and sub-branches. Put down all ideas without judgment 
or evaluation. Step four, think fast. Your brain works best in five to seven minute bursts. So capture that explosion of ideas as rapidly as possible. Keywords, symbols, and images provide a mental shorthand to help you record ideas as quickly as possible. Step five, break boundaries. Break through the eight and a half by 11 mentality that says you have to write on white letter size paper with black ink or pencil. Use ledger paper or easel paper or cover an entire wall with butcher paper. The bigger the paper, the more ideas you'll have. Use wild colors, fat colored markers, crayons, or skinny felt tip pens. You haven't lived until you've mind mapped a report with hot pink and day glow orange crayons. Step six, judge not. Put everything down that comes to mind even if it is completely unrelated. If you're brainstorming ideas for a report on the status of carrots in Ontario and you suddenly remember you need to pick up your cleaning, put down cleaning. Otherwise, your mind will get stuck like a record in that cleaning groove and you'll never generate those great ideas. Step seven. Keep moving. Keep your hand moving. If ideas slow down, draw empty lines and watch your brain automatically find ideas to put on them. Or change colors to re-energize your mind. Stand up and mind map on an easel pad to generate even more energy. Step eight, allow organization. Sometimes you see relationships and connections immediately, and you can add sub-branches to a main idea. Sometimes you don't. So you just connect the ideas to the central focus, and organization can always come later. The first requirement is to get the ideas out of your head and onto the paper. So that's it for mind mapping today. I hope you enjoy the presentation. I express my sincere gratitude to our instructor, Dr. Douglas Major. This is Beth Soriano, and thank you very much. Okay, how did you find it? Did I still talk too fast in the video? <coughs> is it okay? All right, are you ready for the activity now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. Let's do the mind mapping then. I'm giving out um, copies of the eight steps. And I want you to start working on the guide questions that I have listed down beside the steps. You want to go through this one by one? Everyone has a copy? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Remember that mind mapping is a free way of expressing yourselves. All right? So I want you to get a piece of paper, put it beside the sheet where you have the guide, the guide, the steps for making the mind maps. And we will do this together. Okay? Can we do this together? I'd like to see the paper beside your sheets of uh, guide questions. You don't have a sheet of paper? I can give you one. Okay. If you have colored pens with you, 
That will be very good. A pencil will do. You can make some changes later. Okay, I'm looking at your assignment sheet. Okay, it says here, let me go back to that uh, set of questions. Okay, think of an organization or an institution and a change it might be considering. Okay, if you look at the mind mapping steps, you have it there. The first one is step one, center first. Okay, I want you to identify a topic closest to your heart. It can be an institution, it can be an organization. If you want to do a mind map of what course I should take, what program I should take after, uh, after writing 500, you might want to put it there. Okay, if you want to talk about um, a career, for instance, you want to look for a job, you might want to use that as your center and the focal point. Okay? All right. I want you to do step one. Write down a topic closest to your heart. The examples I gave here are programs that you might be interested to take in B at BCIT. For instance, aircraft maintenance, automotive uh, service, etc. Okay. You have your uh, focal point now. I see the others already have theirs, but the others are still probably pondering what they want to put in the center of the paper. Okay, we'll just wait for you then. I'll count one to five, and we move on, okay? Fair enough? All right, one. Three, four, and five. Good. I think most of you, if not all, have something on the, at the center of your paper. Okay, step two. Step two says, lighten up. What makes the topic interesting? So start putting words there. If you want to draw an image, go ahead. You want to draw an aircraft? You want to draw any object? Go ahead. Just put there anything related to the topic that you place at the center of the paper. Put branches if you want. What makes the topic interesting? You, I saw someone write cars. And you might want to write there why you're interested in cars. Okay, one wrote computers. That's good. Okay, let's move to step three. Free associate. And the question there is, what problems he said, the choice of the topic. What are the problems related to the topic that you identified? Okay, identify problems. Or what issue confronts the topic?
feel free to make circles, squares, rectangles, triangles around the words that you have written. If they have a meaning to you, put it there. We're still in step three. What problems beset the choice of your topic? are now moving to step four. Step four says, think fast. And we are asking you now, what are the possible causes of each problem you identify in your map? Remember, we asked you, what are the problems? What are the issues related to the topic? Now we are asking you to identify what could be possible solutions to this problem. Sorry, possible causes, rather. I'm sorry, causes. Step four asks you to write the causes for each problem. Okay, we're shifting gears now. We're moving to step five. Break boundaries. What solutions do you propose for each cause of the problem that you have identified? What solutions do you propose for each cause of the problem that you have <coughs> identified? Step six, judge not. Keep downloading your solutions without judgment. Just put it there. Whatever comes into your mind, put it down. Write it down. Keep downloading solutions without judgment. Step seven, keep moving. This time, I want you to identify who are the stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, who are involved in these problems and who may be able to help resolve these problems. So start identifying who could solve these problems, who are the stakeholders. Write them down. Okay, final step, step eight. Allow organization. I want you to connect the stakeholders to the issues and to the solutions. Identify now your stakeholders and connect them to the problem and connect them to the solution of the problem.
all right? We're working under time pressure. I want you to stop when I count up to three, and when we reach three, we end, all right? One, two, and three. Okay, stop writing now. I just want you to look at your maps. How do you like your maps? Look at your maps. How do you like them? Does anyone want to volunteer showing his or her map to the class? Anyone who'd like to volunteer? Anyone? I'm looking at this map here. Do you want to share your map? Huh? You know, it's small, but what do you see in the map? Any comment on the map? Is it beautiful? It's awesome. Why do you say it's awesome? Uh, it looks like yours. Looks like mine? Yeah? Looks like mine? Yeah? What else? You see the connections? You see the arrows? Right? Okay. Thank you. You have a very good mind map. Okay. Don't you know that a mind map mirrors what you have inside? Hmm? Okay. So if you're very good with association, that tells something of what you can do and what you are. And that's why mind maps are very creative tools, right? Okay, we're doing this very quickly. I'd like to congratulate you. You did it in five minutes. Let's give everyone a big hand. Because normally people take longer than just five minutes working on a mind map. And I think it helped that you had a guide, right? You were just given five minutes to do it. I was, I was making sure that you didn't go beyond five minutes and you did a good job. Okay. Uh, it's not really enough. It's just the start. And I think you already know how to go about a mind map because you've been through this exercise. I'd like to go through um, this question. How did you feel as you were going through or observing through the activity? Because there was one who was watching the sitmate doing it before she did it herself. Okay? How did you feel? Anyone? How did you feel? How did you feel? Did you feel anything at all when you were doing your mind map? Are you? I know. Uh, it was easier to make it. Uh, easier. Yeah. yeah. You think it was easier? Okay. Yes. Very the good. Thank you. The ideas come more and more. Yeah, the idea comes out more naturally, flows naturally, right? It's easier, it's faster. Okay, what else? I think you got it. The reason why you are asked to do mind maps is because as young people, you are supposedly more creative than older people like myself, right? That's why I'm trying to learn the mind map so I can be young like you, okay? So, it's good that you felt that way. And my next question would be, would you consider using mind mapping for your assignments? Okay, that's good. I see heads nodding, that's a good sign. Thank you. So I'm moving to the summary, I only have 45 minutes. I hope I'm not really, I, you don't feel that I'm rushing. Am I rushing? No, no? fine, okay, good. All right. I think you know this guy. Remember we said it's all about problem solving and according to, who's this guy? You know him? Einstein, he says, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, okay? So I've introduced to you one strategy. In fact, I will introduce three strategies for problem solving. The first one has something to do with the problem solving loop, okay? So when you write a memo, for instance, or any problem that you encounter, you try following this loop. Number one, identify the problem. 
Okay? So when you write the memo about the organization that you belong to, identify the problem. What seems to be the problem bugging the organization? Number two, explore information. Create ideas. My mapping will help you do this. Number three, select the best idea. And number four, build and test the idea. And the fifth in the loop is evaluate the results of your idea. Okay? And it's always a loop because usually when you discover something and you resolve a problem, a new problem emerges. And you go through the whole process once again. That's the first strategy. Another one is through a, uh, a mnemonic. Okay? A mnemonic is a tool for you to remember something. Okay? For instance, if you want to solve a problem, idea would be a mnemonic. Identify, define, examine, act, look. I repeat, identify, define, examine, act, look. Okay? I'll, I'll share this material with you. I can email them to you. Okay? So this is a mnemonic that will help you also do your problem solving. Okay? And the third strategy. Okay? When I experience frustration, I stay calm, I look for a logical explanation, I take a deep breath, and I start all over again. Okay? So let's look at the checklist of our, our accomplishments. We said the learning outcome is something that we will not be able to see today. We will probably do it tomorrow. But let's look at the objectives. Did we identify the purposes, the general parts, and the format of the business memo? I gave myself a check. Yeah. <laughs> All right? We did that, right? Okay. Did we showcase mind mapping as a creative tool for preparing a memo? Yeah. Yes. Did we facilitate accomplishment of your assignment by providing you with the guide steps for mind mapping and the strategies for problem solving? Yeah. Yeah. Good. My mission is accomplished. Thank you. So... Thank you very much for the Okay, if you have questions, by the way, you can ask me now. Yes, Omar. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Your, your map is uh, very useful. Thank you. But uh, I, I can use it, but I need more time. I, I, like, I cannot finish that in five minutes. Really, I have. I, I tried to. I want to, to write something. I, I found I spend a lot of time for things. But why in Arabic? If I use my own language, it's easy to find the ideas fast. But I couldn't like find any solution in English. Okay, I think that's valid. I mean, you you're saying that there is a there seems to be a language problem, right? I think. So. But you know, you can do the mind map in your language, and you can do the translation later. Although. Maybe Chris will disagree with me. Chris will probably say, you have to practice English. Do the mind map in English at the start. Okay? All right? But I'm happy that you're saying that it's helpful. If you don't really, if you can't do it in five minutes, you're not alone. People generally make mind maps in 30 minutes to an hour. You know how much time we, we, we worked on when we came up with our own course workshop because we had to come up with a workshop plan? And the teacher said, do a mind map. It took us a week. A week. And we had to do it on the wall. You know, plaster everything with paper. Because we wanted to find out how we can come up with the learning outcome using so many strategies and techniques. Because remember, I'm in the field of teaching. Okay? And it could be done in your whatever field you are interested in. Okay? So don't worry if you can do it in five minutes. You're not alone. People can do mind maps longer than an hour. Like we did ours for a week. Okay, but just keep on practicing because it's also a skill. The more you practice, 
you become you, you're, you become better at working on the mind maps. Okay? Any other question? Yes? So the mind mapping kind of the system, uh, I think is a brainstorming, right? Yes, and that's so right. So when we have lots of the idea when we doing the brainstorming, so which kind of the best solution we can choose? Yeah, ah. Because we search lots of information, right? So maybe we can't give the solution, maybe the three or four, but we can't choose the best. Okay, that's all right. Uh, you don't really have to come up with the best. Okay, for instance, if you're working on a business memo and you already started brainstorming on possible solutions and you don't have a perfect, a one perfect solution, you can present that to the group because more minds mean better ideas. Okay? You don't really have to come up with just one solution. If you're, a, if you're a supervisor asking your staff to come up with a solution to a problem, you may have two or three suggestions, and you can ask your staff to brainstorm with you. And they, they can also engage in mind mapping. So you mean the suitable solution in the special, a special situation, there, right? Suitable. The suitable solution uh, would, well, solutions really um, <coughs> depend on the context because a solution for you may not be a solution for someone else, right? So it's really context-based. For as long as it's uh, a solution that everybody agrees with, then that's fine. And remember, it's always a problem-solving loop. When I mean, you come up with a solution, the solution becomes a problem, right? Then you go through the whole process again. So you have a strategy to uh, solve problems. Okay, so it's not really a perfect uh, tool. Okay, but definitely it's creative. It helps draw out, you know, wild ideas from you, which, you know, wild ideas usually become sources of new inventions. Right? <coughs> Any other questions? No more questions? So I'd like to thank you for the time, and uh, I wish I could know you more. Who knows, one day uh, I can meet you and uh, we can have more time to share ideas. Okay? And again, I'd like to thank Chris for the time. I owe him a lot. So if I get a good mark for this, I'm going to treat him out. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, and uh, good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for that engaging presentation online. You're welcome, Chris. Uh, if you guys want to take a, a brief break, yes, yes? okay, uh, not too long, like five minutes. By the way, those who volunteered, please get your water. That's the only one I can offer for now. Omar, come on. Okay.